Okay, so today we're going to be getting really into the meat of environmental science and we're going to start on chapter three which is ecosystem ecology and a lot of it you would have already had in biology with the food chains and webs and energy pyramids and biogeochemical cycles so hopefully some of it will be review um, but just remember that this is taking it to a higher level so this is when you're probably going to want to take some notes along the way um, this is the opening story and this is a picture of Haiti and you're probably aware of the earthquake that occurred in 2010 that pretty much wiped out Haiti um, the problem that they were having long before this earthquake happened and the earthquake made it worse was them cutting down their trees three-fourths of Haitians live on less than two dollars a day and so they can't afford a lot of energy and so what they will do is chop down trees and they basically slow cook the wood to make charcoal and that's what they will use to cook so because they've used that for a fuel for so long less than two percent of the land now is forested and you can see this picture and you see the right side is quite forested and the left side is very empty and if you look towards the back how empty it is as well um, you're talking about an island so you know it's not that big of a um, area to begin with and so with them chopping down trees constantly they weren't replanting and they were even chopping down some when they were only a few centimeters thick so when they're not replanting and they're just chopping down the trees there you go it's just like what happened on Easter Island it's just what happened in the Lorax um, so when you don't have trees there anymore the land starts to become much more susceptible to erosion so the roots start to die they don't stabilize the soil and so the soil will start to get uh, eroded away by heavy rains and because they're in this tropical area in the Caribbean they're very susceptible to these uh, downpours and so then you've got mudslides and landslides and uh, and then the topsoil is no longer fertile once it all goes away the US has tried to step in and planted about 60 million trees but then again the natives would not allow them to grow for very long and they chopped them down to use them for fuel they had no incentive to let them keep growing when they needed it so instead a new effort was to plant mango trees and the mango trees provided anywhere from seventy to hundred fifty dollars worth of mangoes per year so that gave them an economic incentive to allow the tree to reach maturity and actually get money from it by selling mangoes before they could even decide to chop it down so this is just showing you how just like in Easter Island how a civilization completely alters the ecosystem by human activities so in chapter 3 we start off talking about what an ecosystem is and it's a location on earth distinguished by its interacting biotic and abiotic components so biotic is anything that is living animals plants insects bacteria and the abiotic factors would be sunlight temperature soil water nutrients etc the components of an ecosystem are highly dependent on climate and climate is what we're going to talk about in chapter four and with all the different biomes hence that's why all the biomes are so different in Death Valley which is a desert you're gonna have a very different ecosystem from an Antarctic ecosystem even though that's a frozen desert um, or the Death Valley desert would be much different from a tropical rainforest they have different temperatures but more importantly different levels of rainfall and that level of rainfall will determine which kind of organisms can survive in that ecosystem some ecosystems like caves and lakes have very distinctive boundaries this allows the scientists to be able to look at the interactions between those biotic and abiotic components at once because they're kind of trapped there and they're not able to really move especially with a cave um, you know that there's some water that comes into the cave there's only certain organisms that can li live in the cave 
and then when the bats leave and come back you know they poop and their feces is food for more organisms which then organisms can feed on that so it's a very self-sustaining ecosystem and same thing with a lake um, even an ocean even though it's quite large still has very distinctive boundaries only certain organisms can live in the different layers of a lake or an ocean and we'll talk about that um, again in a later chapter but in most ecosystems it is hard to determine where one ecosystem stops and the next one begins so sometimes they will run into each other like grasslands you know kind of gradually dying down into a forest for example this slide is going to be showing you that ecosystems can be very large or quite small so the picture on the left showing the greater Yellowstone ecosystem includes Yellowstone National Park but also surrounding areas so basically it's now about 50 million acres 50 million acres um, that is part of that ecosystem the park itself is only two and a half million but that's a pretty large park considering what we have here in town so that's a very large ecosystem and then the picture on the right is showing you a very smaller ecosystem even just a little pool of water in a rotted hole in a tree could carry bacteria uh, one celled other organisms small invertebrates and and so on um, even the water in an empty tire hanging from a tree outside your house could have an organism especially when it comes to mosquitoes even though it's helpful to distinguish between two different ecosystems we know that ecosystems are going to interact with others um, and when we talk about that we mean the organisms between them especially if they're mobile that's what they were noticing with the Yellowstone was that grizzly bears were coming in and out of the park and interacting with different ecosystems surrounding it so then we get into um, energy flows and it all starts with the Sun and producers or autotrophs make sure you know both terms take the Sun's energy to produce usable energy which would be sugar through the process of photosynthesis so notice that oxygen in the top picture which is photosynthesis is a waste product glucose is stored until it's used but oxygen is a waste product and that's where we get the oxygen from our trees and plants so uh, you do need to know the balanced equation for photosynthesis and then respiration is just the opposite they take the sugar and oxygen and convert it back to water and carbon dioxide you'll have to pardon some of the noise sometimes I, I live right next to the airport and there's planes flying constantly um, okay so as long as you know the photosynthesis and respiration equations knowing that respiration is basically backwards from photosynthesis all organisms are going to respire and at night producers only respire since there is no sunlight to capture so they just respire um, and so they'll take in oxygen but not generating it so overall though producers will photosynthesize more than they respire so there is a net excess of oxygen that gets released into the air and then there's a net excess of carbon that gets stored in the tissues and we'll get uh, talking about that when we're in the carbon cycle so some parts of trophic levels consumers are also called heterotrophs they obtain energy by consuming other organisms the primary consumers are the herbivores so they eat the producers or plants secondary consumers are carnivores and they eat the primary consumers or herbivores and then tertiary consumers are basically the top of the food chain they are carnivores um, they could be or uh, excuse me omnivores they could be omnivores and eat both um, secondary and uh, secondary consumers and producers this is showing you a typical food chain uh, the one on the left is the terrestrial food chain so the producer is the grass zebras eat the grass they're the primary consumer lion is the secondary consumer on the right you have an aquatic food chain a very typical one you have algae that is eaten by zooplankton you know, the zooplankton are the ones that will eat the algae 
uh, fish eat the zooplankton, and then the eagle is the tertiary consumer and comes and eats the fish. I guess I didn't really need to explain that one. Sorry. But other parts of the food chain are really important, um, and those are the scavengers, detritivores, and decomposers. Scavengers are, are carnivores, and they will consume dead animals. So like your vultures or hyenas, they'll eat dead animals. Detritivores consume the dead animals even more, but break it down into smaller particles. And that's called detritus, those waste products. Then decomposers come along, like your bacteria and fungi, like even mushrooms, that will complete the breakdown by taking those dead tissues, uh, nutrients, and return it back into the soil. From there, the soil is now fertilized better with those nutrients. The sun strikes it with water and your plants start growing again and your food chain starts again. So your food chain is a sequence of consumption from producers through tertiary consumers, but realistically in the real world it doesn't follow one line so we get into food chains, excuse me, food webs, which are many food chains that are interacting. So here's an example of a terrestrial um, food web and you can see here um, that some organisms have more than one role. So notice the lion. It is a scavenger as well as a secondary consumer. So a lion will feed on dead animals as well. And then you see the yellow dots are the primary consumers and so on. All right, productivity. Productivity is taught, we, well, first we need to know how much energy is available in an ecosystem because that's going to determine how much life that that ecosystem can support. So if we want to know how much energy is in the system, we look at the gross primary productivity. And what that is, is the total amount of solar energy that the producers will capture via photosynthesis. So that's the total amount of solar energy but we know that plants will also respire. So the net primary productivity is how much total energy is captured by the plants minus the amount that they respire. So it's actually, if you solve an equation, um, it's actually very easy. It's the gross primary productivity minus the net, excuse me, minus respiration equals the net. Producers will typically capture only about 1% of the solar energy that's coming via photosynthesis. So the energy that they do capture, which is the GPP or gross primary productivity, uh, is divided into energy that they use, for, that the plants use for respiration and energy. So you see that 60% of the 1% is lost to respiration and only 40% of that 1% is used for growth and reproduction. So here's an example of net primary productivity. Keep in mind when you do the questions um, on the test you have no calculator but they give you numbers that are very easy to work with. So a forest in Oregon might have a gross primary productivity of 3.5 kilograms of carbon per meter squared per year and lose 1.5 kilograms of carbon meter squared per year to respiration by the plants. Therefore, the net primary productivity is 3.5 minus 1.5, and that will give you 2.0 kilograms of carbon per meter squared per year. So what does that mean? That means that the plants living in a one square meter forest of forest will add 2 kilograms of carbon to their tissues by growth and reproduction that is part of that 40% 40% there uh, from the 1% of energy that they got in the first place. So essentially just know that net primary productivity is gross minus respiration. <coughs> Excuse me. Productivity is highest where temperatures are warm and solar energy and water are abundant. That kind of makes sense. So the most productive ecosystems are going to be your tropical rainforest, which is a terrestrial biome because it has high temperatures and high levels of rainfall. Coral reefs 
are the most diverse and productive aquatic ecosystem um, in the tropical areas, salt marshes, um, which you'll find a lot on the edges of coastlines right before you get to the ocean. It's almost like a transition zone. So a lot of them are in um, the southeast, Florida, for example. Those are very uh, productive. Biomass is the total amount of energy in an ecosystem. So biomass is the total mass of all living matter in a specific area. Uh, so trees, anything, mostly plants, um, dead or alive. A standing crop is how much of biomass is present in an area at a particular time. So just keep in mind that standing crop measures the amount of energy at a time and productivity is measuring the rate because remember GPP or NPP is how many kilograms of carbon per meter squared per year. So anytime you have time that would be a rate. So productivity is a rate. Um, so for example as far as productivity slow growing forests are going to have low productivity. That kind of makes sense because if they're not if they don't grow very fast they're not going to produce much biomass so they don't have much energy but if you have a long-lived forest or slow growing the standing crop which is how much how many trees have accumulated over the time is actually high and uh, an example that's the opposite is algae they have a very high productivity high growth rate okay but because the primary consumers will eat them so quickly the standing crop or the total amount of bio, uh, biomass at that moment is actually really low so make sure you understand the difference between that and that's on page 64 65 so next is ecological efficiency and that is a percentage just like we did with calculating the efficiency of an incandescent light bulb and that is how much or the proportion of consumed energy that is passed from one trophic level to another. So from producers to primary consumers to secondary and so on. Um, efficiency can range anywhere from 5 to 20 percent, but average is about 10 percent across ecosystems. And generally in an AP question, they'll use that average of 10 percent. You can represent ecological efficiency um, and distribution of biomass on a trophic pyramid such as this. So you can see that the producers will have the largest amount of energy available. The primary consumers then will eat that energy, okay, but only 10% is passed across to the next trophic level, okay. Um, and so even though that will range the, the efficiency will range from ecosystem to ecosystem. The pyramid itself will actually look similar. It also makes sense because the structure of the pyramid, because we know that there are, um, there is a lot more grass or plants compared to the primary consumers, and there are a lot more primary consumers con uh, compared to secondary consumers, and there are more secondary consumers compared to tertiary consumers. One thing that is good to think about, at, let me go back, um, about ecological efficiency is even thinking about our own diet, and they talk about in the book that if all humans were to act only as primary consumers, so if we became vegetarians, would we harvest much more energy from an area? And the answer would be yes. So if you could assume that there was a 10% ecological efficiency in this imaginary uh, cropland that I'm talking about, and let's say I had a thousand kilograms of soybeans, that would be enough to feed the cattle to produce approximately 100 kilograms of meat, right? Because 100 kilograms of meat is 10% of the 1,000 kilograms of soybeans. In terms of biomass or total amount of energy available, there's 10 times more food available for humans if we were eating just the soybeans because we're getting 1,000 kilograms of soybeans versus 100 kilograms of meat. Does that make sense? A kilogram of soybeans contains two and a half times as many calories 
as a kilogram of beef. Therefore, an acre of land is going to produce 25 more calories when used for soybeans than when used for beef. So when we act like secondary consumers that we are and we eat meat, the animals have to have land so they can eat the producers so that we can in turn eat the meat. So when we act as vegetarians and only eat the plants, we only require that land for the plants. So there's actually more land for us, there's more calories for us, and so that's one reason why going vegetarian is better th for the environment. Okay, the biosphere, that is the region of the earth where life resides. Bio meaning life. Energy flows through the biosphere. So it all starts from the sun, it moves through the living and non-living parts, and then ultimately emitted back into space by Earth in the atmosphere. Matter, well, we knew that Earth is an open system when it comes to energy because the energy comes from the sun and it can go back out. But matter, as we learned in chapter two, um, does not leave Earth. And so in terms of matter, Earth is a closed system. We know that it's a closed system because we have so many cycles. You have the rock cycle, you have the water cycle, and um, that's when we're moving matter around, but it's not really leaving Earth. And so the movement of matter between ecosystems involves biological, geological, and chemical processes. So we call that, surprisingly, biogeochemical cycles. I will say that the two most important ones to learn are the water cycle and the nitrogen cycle, especially the nitrogen cycle, and then third is the carbon cycle. The other cycles they hardly mention on the AP exam, but nitrogen cycle uh, and water cycle are always on there. So let's start with the uh, water cycle, or the hydrologic cycle. Simply the movement of water through the biosphere. So notice that it will start with, uh, in this case, it starts with the solar energy hitting the earth. Well, when heat or the sun hits the water, it causes it to evaporate. As water evaporates, it rises, cools, and condenses into clouds. And it'll, those will bind to particulate matter in the clouds. I had to pause for a second, so I forgot where I left off. So the water rises, cools, and condenses into clouds. And you've also got evapotranspiration from plants, and that's when water is leaving the leaves um, into the atmosphere. So when you combine evaporation and transpiration from plants, they call it as one whole evapotranspiration. And then eventually the clouds will be so saturated that you'll, it'll fall as precipitation, okay? And then it will either uh, be absorbed by the soil and percolate down into the groundwater into an aquifer um, or it will move off as runoff which means it'll just move across the land into the streams and rivers and ultimately it goes out to the ocean which is the ultimate pool of water. So then when the sun hits the ocean water the evaporation starts again and the water cycle starts again. So those are the vocabulary terms, transpiration, evapotranspiration, and runoff. Human activities can alter the hydrologic cycle. I don't think that that's any news to anybody. When we um, cut down trees in any way, whether we just cut them or slash and burn, which means we cut them down and then burn the area, we'll talk about that much more later. Um, you're reducing the amount of evapotranspiration by the plants because you don't have the plants there to transpire. So you're reducing the amount of water that goes back into the atmosphere and it can affect uh, weather patterns, precipitation patterns. Sometimes that can even um, lead to flooding because you don't have the trees there with those roots to anchor the soil like, this, like the story at the beginning with Haiti and so the, excuse me, the water doesn't percolate down into the soil, it just runs off. Especially when you have paved surfaces. So lots of development in an area will cause increased runoff, uh, increased evaporation. So in some areas it could 
lead to flooding. Here in San Antonio, we are really prone to flash flooding. For one, we're really flat. Um, but as the city becomes bigger and bigger and there's more development, they're paving over the soil that could hold the water. And so it just runs off and we, we get flash flooding. It's one contributing factor. The topography is the other. Um, but that's also one reason to not develop so much. When you have nice forested areas, to not cut them down to make room for a new Walmart. And that's actually happening um, in my area right at Wurzbach Parkway and Blanco. Uh, they're getting ready to build a huge Walmart there where it's just trees. And I'm really upset about it. It's right next to uh, uh, Hardburger Park. The next cycle is the carbon cycle. You learned from organic molecules or organic chemistry that carbon well, is organic chemistry, and it's the most important element in living organisms. It forms membranes and walls, it's the backbone of proteins, it stores energy for later use, so it's really important. And there are two parts to the carbon cycle, there's fast and there's slow. The fast part's going to involve any process that is associated with a living organism, and the slow part involves that with abiotic factors, such as rocks or soil, or fossil fuels once they are made. So take a look at the carbon cycle here. You are going to need to know what is going on at each stage, but I like this graphic and so it shows you really what's going on. So when producers photosynthesize, they take in the CO2, incorporate that carbon into their tissues. Some of that's going to be returned to the, the atmosphere when the organisms respire or when they die. So when they die, then you have more biomass and it becomes part of this pool. Okay, um, And then decomposers will break that down and then eventually returns that CO2 to the atmosphere and they'll continue that part of the cycle. There's also a large amount of carbon dioxide that is exchanged or carbon that's exchanged between the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, CO2 that's released from the ocean just about equals the amount of the atmospheric CO2 that dissolves in the water. And so since they're constantly exchanged, they're basically in a steady state. Remember, the input equals the output. Um, sometimes the carbon dioxide will enter the food web uh, via photosynthesis. Sometimes uh, carbon will combine with calcium to produce calcium carbonate, which is limestone, and that's very uh, popular rock that's in the ocean and uh, some that are get buried are incorporated into ocean sediments and then this becomes our fossil fuels so that carbon gets buried and stuck there for millions of years and will eventually form the fossil fuels and if you've noticed our fossil fuels well the coal and oil they're generally black and if you've ever seen fossils those that are carbonaceous films are the black outlines left from the organism. The, all the tissue and bone disintegrated over time, but that imprint that was left behind is pure carbon. That's why they call it a carbon film. Um, so it just is black. So your charcoal that you use for your barbecue pit, it's carbon. It's black. Um, where was I? So the fifth state, or excuse me, fourth, is the human extraction of the fossil fuels. So when we take out that carbon and we burn it, that combustion is returning that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. The problem with that, though, is that we are adding much more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that can be taken out and that can be buried. Um, and so that's part of the problem with combusting fossil fuels. Not only are they a fossil fuel, so they're non-renewable, but their combustion is what is contributing to uh, a rise in temperature, potentially global warming. You know, before the Industrial Revolution, the, the carbon cycle was pretty much in a, in, in, in a steady state. It was able to, you know, the inputs were equaling the outputs. but since the Industrial Revolution, all that combustion, yeah, the, the CO2 that gets emitted into the atmosphere is greater.
the nitrogen cycle. This is one that you're basically going to have to memorize and we'll also have an activity in class uh, to show you how it travels. But it's the most complex cycle and nitrogen, you know, 78% of the atmosphere, it's a pretty pretty uh, important element and it is a limiting nutrient in plants, meaning plants will not grow without nitrogen. They could have other elements there, um, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, but if they don't have nitrogen, they're not going to live. So you need to totally make sure that you know this cycle. And I'm glad that they have the definitions there for you. So first, uh, you have nitrogen fixation, and that is when the bacteria will fix the atmospheric nitrogen, the N2, and turn it into ammonia. And eventually, uh, it'll turn into ammonium. Nitrogen fixation can also happen through lightning. If lightning struck an area, uh, the nitrogen can get fixed into ammonium that way, or during the combustion processes um, of fossil fuels. When you have lightning or the combustion process and in, in burning fossil fuels, it will actually fix the nitrogen gas, N2, into nitrate, not ammonium. So notice that bacteria convert N2 into ammonium and abiotic processes like lightning or the combustion of fossil fuels convert it into nitrate. Both of those products is a form of nitrogen that can be used by the producers because the producers don't use it as N2. So once the producers are able to get this nitrogen in either ammonium or nitrate, they assimilate it, means they just, they take it in. Consumers will take it in by eating the producers. Eventually, both the producers and the consumers will die and decompose, and then they, and then you have ammonification. And so that's when the decomposers break down all those nitrogen compounds into ammonium, hence ammonification. After that, ammonium is going to be turned into nitrite and then nitrate by bacteria. So anytime there's nitrification um, or nitrogen fixation, there's going to be bacteria involved. So probably the most important organism in the nitrogen cycle or part of it are the bacteria. Um, Nitrate is, like I said, is used by producers and, and will, it's of great importance later. Um, nitrate doesn't bind, bind easily to soil particles, so therefore it's carried along in water and that's called leaching. So leached nitrates will eventually settle in the bottom of oceans or lakes and then the denitrifying bacteria will start to convert that nitrate in a series of steps, you know, it doesn't matter the, which steps, but that they convert the nitrate into nitrous oxide and then finally into, or nitrogen gas, dinitrogen gas, which then is emitted back into the atmosphere. So that whole process is called denit denitrification. As I said before, nitrogen is a limiting nutrient and so it can't live, plants can't live without it, but if you have too much of it, then they're going to overgrow. And this is a big problem um, with fertilizers because fertilizers have a lot of nitrate in them. So when you have uh, fertilizers that run into the water, the nitrate is a nutrient and so algae, for instance, will start to overgrow. Once it starts to overgrow, um, then they will basically cover the top of a lake and then uh, it suffocates the fish and other organisms because it becomes anoxic, meaning it loses carbon, excuse me, it loses oxygen. Okay, because I spent a while on the nitrogen cycle, I'm going to speed up through the phosphorus cycle. Um, the phosphorus cycle is basically um, an abiotic cycle uh, until you have too much in the water. There is no gaseous component of phosphorus. The major source you get is it being um, released from rocks as the rocks weather. Is there, okay, there we go. Well, let me go back. Um, 
phosphorus does actually bind to soil so it doesn't flow through the water but it is a limiting nutrient so again plants need phosphorus in order to grow but as you see here on this slide too much phosphorus or phosphate um, which are in fertilizers as well just like nitrate can cause an algal bloom what happens is that the algae will just grow uncontrollably and cover the top of a lake and I think there's a picture here um, and then eventually they suck up all the the oxygen when they start to decompose so because the area has very low oxygen the other animals are going to suffocate plus it blocks out the sunlight and other organisms can't photosynthesize so here you see uh, the weathering of rocks is going to release the phosphates fertilizers can also get into the water okay so study that um, cycle but you don't need to know the steps as much basically I want you to know where phosphorus um, initially enters the cycle and that is from anthropogenically that's from fertilizers but naturally it's from rocks calcium magnesium and potassium are also important um, most come from rocks and then decomposed plants potassium is important um, to plants because it does not bind so easily to the soil so it could be washed away by water or leached away so usually when we test plants uh, or soil fertility we look for potassium as well calcium and magnesium are abundant in soils um, and those are important minerals to plants The last cycle is the sulfur cycle, and sulfur exists mostly in rocks, and it, like phosphorus, will be released into soils uh, and water as the rocks break apart and weather. Plants will take in that sulfur through roots in the form of sulfate, which is SO4, and it cycles through the food chain. But there is a gaseous component, and that's when it comes out of a volcanic eruption, and that's sulfur dioxide. We also get sulfur dioxide when we burn fossil fuels. Um, coal especially releases sulfur dioxide. It's the dirtiest fossil fuel to burn is coal. Um, and then when you're mining the coal um, from the actual mining processes, sulfur dioxide is released. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, what happens is the SO2, uh, the sulfur dioxide mixes with water to get H2SO4 well that's sulfuric acid and so that will end up falling as rain because remember it's in the atmosphere so it binds with uh, the water molecules in the clouds and it falls as acid rain that's where we get acid rain it's very mild and it's very dilute but over time it's eroding uh, things away all right so a disturbance a disturbance is an event called by, caused by physical, chemical, or biological agents that results in changes in population size or community composition. There could be anthropogenic, remember that means human caused, so a lot of that, um, a lot of disturbances are ours. So that's from us developing, cutting down trees and paving streets to make room for human activities, um, clearing areas for agriculture, air pollution mining those are all disturbances to ecosystems that were already established natural disturbances therefore are just you know mother nature forest fires that were naturally started hurricanes tsunamis volcanoes okay almost done um, this is showing you an area of a natural disturbance so they had this nice um, water area like a an island type place and um, two days after the hurricane made landfall, it shows you how the erosion came through. You lost a lot of the vegetation in the background, etc. Um, watershed just seemed to be kind of stuck in this chapter, although we normally talk about it in water resources. But just so you know the vocabulary, it is um, a place where all of the land in a given area drains into per a particular stream, river, or lake. So the watersheds in our area will drain to the San Antonio River, 
and in turn the San Antonio River drains into the Gulf of Mexico. In a watershed there's no deep percolation of water so all precipitation that falls on it leaves by transpiration or runoff and in that case it's good because the runoff you know causes it to go into the stream and then eventually into the ocean. In other areas that doesn't mean that the entire area is a watershed it just means that in some areas are um, especially because San Antonio has a pretty large um, groundwater system obviously not all of our water goes off to the Gulf of Mexico. So there's an example of a watershed and typically a diagram of a watershed will be in a valley um, that the river is going through the middle of a valley so all the runoff would naturally uh, go into the river. Resistance, a measure of how much a disturbance can affect the flows of energy and matter. So high resistance mean when the disturbance has affected populations, so the populations have maybe died off a little bit, but the overflow, excuse me, the overall flow of energy is okay. So for example, if you had a small fire that would kill maybe some plants, like in a forest, um, it might kill some species, but at the same time, it might benefit other species that can use the additional nutrients that come from the burned or dead plants. So although some species are affected or populations are affected, the overall energy uh, could stay the same, the overall net primary productivity. Resilience is a rate, so something that happens over time, and it tells you how quickly uh, an ecosystem can return to its state after a disturbance. So if it had a high resilience, that means it will return to its original state very rapidly, so it grew back quickly. If it had a low resilience, meaning it took a really long time to recover. And so restoration ecology is a new uh, science area that will take damaged ecosystems and try to restore them. There is a picture, and it's not here, um, on page 76 that shows how um, the wetlands in Florida and the Chesapeake Bay of Virginia are trying to be restored by ecologists and it's very expensive but it's because we drain the wetlands in Florida and so that productivity of that ecosystem went way down and it wasn't able to be very resilient and so they decided well I guess we better fix that uh, before you know it gets any worse. The next slide is intermediate disturbance hypothesis which just says that ecosystems that have intermediate levels of disturbance, so nothing that's too drastic, nothing that wipes out everything, um, are they're more diverse than those with higher or low disturbance levels. So a low disturbance level would be like a few small fires um, every once in a while, you know, so not a whole lot of things are affected. Or again, if it's very high disturbance level, everything is, is destroyed. Well, if in that case, in either low or high, you're not going to have that many species that are going to be there. And it, it's easier to think in the high range because if, say like with Mount St. Helens, destroyed that ecosystem, well, not very many things survived for a long time. And so its number of species are going to be low. So if there's, the point is, is that if there's an intermediate amount of disturbance, meaning just a few moderate level um, like earthquakes or floods or forest fire every once in a while it's going to tend to have more species. It's going to tend to have higher biodiversity. The last section is ecosystems providing services and there are um, two types of values with ecosystems. There's instrumental and there's intrinsic. Instrumental means that it it is worth as an instrument or a tool that can be used and so we can use them uh, five different ways. One is a provision which just means something we can use directly so medicinal plants, lumber, food. Um, regulating services those are you know um, the, the plants that are providing us with the ability to take in more carbon than otherwise would happen. 
Another instrumental value is a support system, and those are those services that natural ecosystems will provide, so pollination. That's a natural a value and tool of an ecosystem. Natural filters meaning that as water is percolating down the soil and it's not heavily polluted, the soil will eventually filter out the water so you have clean water and doesn't have to be treated at a plant. Pest control meaning that you could have natural pest controls by, na by getting natural predators instead of um, chemicals. Resilience will ensure, so the ability to recover means that it's going to continue to provide benefits to humans. So the resilience of ecosystems is actually really important and how fast it can uh, be resilient uh, depends on the species diversity. So if it has a very low species diversity, it's probably not going to be very resilient. However, if you have a very high biodiversity, chances are it's likely to be resilient, more resilient. And lastly, the instrumental value of ecosystems would be cultural services. Sometimes we just like to go to a park and look at nature for itself. That's a service, even though we may not see it as economic. However, we could be charging people to get into a park, so then it does turn into economic. Finally, last slide, intrinsic value. The intrinsic value of, of ecosystems is that it's, it's valuable even though it may not have any benefit to us. And so you'll find that the, the very early conservationists who were rich white men wanted us to save the environment for future generations. Environmentalists wanted to save the environment for the, for the sake of the environment in itself and that we have an obligation to protect it because of just its intrinsic value. This, all right. I know that it went a little bit longer than I anticipated, but we were getting into the meat of environmental science now, so make sure you go over those biogeochemical cycles, and um, if you have any questions, let me know.